And so let's begin again with the Russian cultural age. And <clears throat> see if I can find my place here. So I was talking about in this Russian cultural age will come a time when all women will be infertile. And I tried to say this is why Steiner mentioned that the Russian soul will be the one to develop eugenics or the mysteries regarding bringing a human into a body properly fit for their mission on earth. With the rise of infertility, one can see how important this will become. Then from around the year 6000 AD until the seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, um, no one will be born into physical bodies. Steiner mentions that we will need to work with the fallen spirits of darkness through whom we will be enabled to keep our connection with the physical earth ongoing. Thus, for 2,000 years from when women will have become infertile, and perhaps even more time because they'll be infertile earlier, um, will come an end of the period of incarnation. And then we'll have a return of the moon. And at that point, we can ask the question, what will our physical bodies be? Well, they won't be. Um, but perhaps we'll have humanoid robotic bodies to use by then. This puts our imminent confrontation with Araman in an entirely different light. You see, as a result of this confrontation, we will be prepared to deal with these fallen angels of darkness in this period of time after the end of incarnation. So evolution must continue up to and through both the earthly event of the war of all against all and the cosmic event of the return of the moon. By then, our lowest bodily member will be our etheric body. So you can see, this isn't so far away. This war of all against all will not be like wars as we know them now. Egoism will sever one's connection with the earth, leaving afterwards an earth covered with a web of highly intelligent, spidery beings whose existence will be somewhere between the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom. And at the start of the ninth millennium, that's when the moon will return to the earth. This will be soon after that great war of all against all. And it has to be said, it is divine will that these events happen and that they happen at the right time. After this, we enter the sixth epoch. The survivors will be from the Russian cultural age. And they are the ones who will lead what's left of humanity into this new existence. Now, it's interesting. Artists have been quite aware of something of these dangers and this coming. All the way back in 1818, Mary Shelley, while returning from a study group that was dealing with mythology, got the inspiration for her story and interesting, the title Frankenstein, who is the, uh, the doctor, the creator, or the modern Prometheus. She had an imagination of the connection of the Promethean myth to the developing science of her time. Her picture revealed that the direction of the technology was leading in her story, that is, to the creation of a near human creature that would be created through the use of electricity. Her story wrestles with the question, could such a creature become capable of morals and of love? Her foresight for our times was remarkable. We also find increasing many Promethean characters and Hephaestian automatons in today's stories 
especially in our movies such as Transcendence, Matrix, Ex Machina, and so forth. We could also add Ray Kurzweil's books, such as The Singularity is Near, in which he declares that in the, by the year 2045, an artificially intelligent computer will be more intelligent than all humans currently living on the earth at that time. And all of that for less than $2,000. Where do these pictures of the future come from? Well, we know that the angels are working upon man's astral body. They too are preparing us for this future. And in their work upon the man's astral body, they compose pictures for us that show how this future may unfold. In one's artistic imagination, one can access these pictures that are in our astral bodies. But we color these pictures according to our concepts. Therefore, Ray Kurzweil's picture of the future is, interestingly, very similar to Steiner's but rays is colored with materialism. We heard earlier that the consciousness of our will is sleeping. So currently, we also sleep through this work of the angels. Steiner implores us to awaken to this and to other spiritual activities. He says, if men do not allow this to be achieved in the astral body while they are awake, the angels would, in this case, endeavor to fulfill their aims through their sleeping bodies. Therefore, what the angels could not achieve because of their waking life, men slept through it, would be achieved with the help of the physical and etheric bodies of men during actual sleep. It is there that the angels would seek forces required for the fulfillment of what could not be achieved through men in their wide awake consciousness when the souls were within the etheric and astral bodies in the waking state. It would be achieved by means of the etheric bodies in that case, and thus in the sleeping state, when human beings who ought to be awake to what is going on were outside of those bodies with their ego and astral bodies. Here lies a great danger in the age of the spiritual or consciousness soul. This is what might still happen if before the beginning of the third millennium, which is now, men were continue to refuse to turn to the spiritual life. It might happen that the aim of the angels in their work would have to be achieved by means of the sleeping bodies of men instead of through wide awake individuals. The angels might still be compelled to withdraw their whole work from the astral body and submerge it into the etheric body in order to bring it to fulfillment. So we can see there are some big possibilities and out of our human freedom, we can have the course of our future go in one way or another. So, I want to take a look at this merging of technology with humanity and our bodies. Here we see a bionic limb, an arm. There were, there's been at least three Austrians who have had replacements for their injured hands or arms with bionic ones. And they've learned to control these. And we'll talk a little bit about how this control takes place. Interestingly, his four-year-old son at the time said, my father is a robot. Well, the way this can begin to work is that an amputee reports that they still have a phantom limb and that they feel still through that amputated limb. Um, some people call this mirror touch thinesthesia. Now, what I find so impressive, if people have made prosthetic limbs for children, because children grow, they would have to continually change these expensive prosthetic limbs. They're able to use a $2,000 3D printer to make the parts for a prosthetic limb that these children, as you can see, can control. 
So I'm going to ask a question. Can we fall in love, say, with a person with a bionic finger? Well, that seems possible, probably. What about if they have a bionic arm? Or a bionic arm and a leg? You can see where I'm going with this. What about a transplanted face? Obviously, we love grandparents or old elder people who may have a pacemaker already in their bodies. What about if they had bionic eyes? Or what if there's somebody that we only knew through their avatar? Could we still come to say that we love them? Well, the world is changing. And here you see an example of where this technology can go. Here are sex bots, or you might call them artificial mates, that are being sold already. And so it's it raised the question, um, will robots uh, become our sexual objects? And in fact, in this article, will robots replace men? And so it begs the question um, that was in the movie Surrogates that starred Bruce Willis, um, are we headed to a time where our physical bodies will disappear and we will have to live through robotic bodies? Is that possible? And here's a couple quotes from Steiner. In the present evolutionary state, the human being is organized in such a way that the ego in astral bodies must make use of the physical sense organs in order to become aware of the physical world. Well, that makes sense. But what about the next evolutionary state that we're starting to enter? Human beings, the human being has sense organs in the astral body which enable perception in the astral world, but these have normally not been developed. Well, here we see an individual who studied how ostriches run and developed these strap-on items that allow him to run up to 25 miles per hour. You can see the beginning of ways of adding on to augment the physical body to become a superhuman body. Who would do such a thing? Well, soldiers would, athletes might, macho guys might, weekend warriors, maybe even homeowners trying to get the yard chores done and so on. So I bring this up because I think um, and many others do, that we're approaching a time where robotics that may have been developed for people with disabilities will be used by people who have normal human bodies. This human augmentation is something that is drawing research all around the world. And here's a number of websites if you want to look into this more. So I mentioned before that um, there are ways to learn how does the brain think it still has a limb when it's already been amputated, the so-called phantom limb. And here are ways that paraplegics and other people with amputated limbs have learned to use prosthetics or these wearable robots. And that is that they look at uh, when a command, audio command is given to them, they look at the signature of the activity going on in the brain. And so here's an example of that. So different parts of the brain will show activity. And for these people then, that is their um, signature. The scientists say that's a signature. So if they said something like, pick up that glass of water, the activity of reaching out their phantom arm to grab that uh, will set off a signature in the brain and then they will use that for the prosthetic limb to reach out and grab that glass of water. But you can see this is a slippery slope. 
one that will go well beyond those who are disabled. Now Steiner could foresee this coming connection of the human and the mechanical. So I put in some more quotes from him that in the fifth post-Atlantean period, we will have to solve the problem of how human moods, the moods, the motions emanating from human moods, allow themselves to be translated into waves or motions on machines, and how man must be brought into connection with what must become mechanical. It says the will is there to harness human energy to mechanical energy, but we shouldn't treat these things by fighting against them. No, they will not fail to appear. They're going to come. And so the question is, who are we entrusting these to? Not the what that's going to come, but who is going to bring these into humanity? And so it begs the question, shouldn't anthroposophists be part of what's bringing these into existence? Steiner goes on to describe how in this fifth Atlantean cultural age, it says epoch there, it should say cultural age, so many problems have lost all inner and vital warmth. The countless questions which confront us when we study spiritual science with any depth simply do not exist for the modern man with his materialistic outlook. A different form of experience will come to the man of modern times. And you can see that it goes on to talk about how this drying up of one's etheric body will allow these aromonic beings that we talked about before, these powers, to attach themselves like a second nature to the human being. So Steiner goes on to point out um, that this merging, this welding together of human beings with machines will be a great and important problem for the rest of human evolution. And he goes on to say, I have often pointed out, even in public lectures, that human consciousness depends on destructive forces. During public lectures in Basel, I twice said that in our nerve system, we are always in process of dying. These forces of death will become stronger and stronger, and we shall find that they are related to the forces of electricity and magnetism and to those that work in machines. A man will be able, in a certain sense, to guide his, his intentions and his thoughts into the forces of machines. Forces in human nature that are still unknown will be discovered. Forces that will act upon external electricity and magnetism. So this is quite a challenge for us. There, is, there are ways in which Steiner points out uh, through what he calls a material occultism that will be developed um, that will have act, uh, the ability, such as, as in Strader's machine and his mystery dramas, to begin their activity. These machines will be set in motion by what seem to be insignificant vibrations emanating out of the human being based on their mood or their moral intentions. And Steiner points out further, um, he calls it in another case a mechanical occultism, that these mechanisms um, will not only render it possible to do without nine tenths of the labor that is still performed by human hands. And we have lots of uh, recent reports that have indicated that in the next uh, 10 to 20 years, up to 80% is what these reports are saying of current human labor will disappear. And he goes on to say the capacity to set motors in motion according to the laws of reciprocal oscillations, remember this term reciprocal, will develop on a great scale among the English-speaking peoples. And he goes on in other ones to especially point to the Americas. So this little diagram I did 
um, talks about the boundaries, and especially this boundary between the etheric and the physical, because it is at boundaries that we can experience these uh, vibrations. Here you see between water and air, at that boundary you can have the vibrations of a drop in water, in the waveforms. Keeley, an American, was aware of this, and he was the one that developed the first mechanical occultism that is to be developed here in the West. And he got his machines initially uh, in his work started by playing on a violin. So music through him would start these machines. And Steiner points out that these in the future will start based on the morality of the person approaching them. So Steiner also refers to the ending of our physical bodies. And he says, in as much as the human being becomes softer and softer, he'll be separating himself from the hard parts. Um, and as he does this, he is approaching his future. And um, so an age comes when man will live above his earthly portion. And he'll be able to draw his etheric body out of his physical body at will. So what kind of physical body is that? Well, this changing body, it will be as if the denser part of man were here below on earth and the human being will make use of it from the outside like an instrument. Man will no longer bear his body about and live within it, but will float above it the body will itself have become rarefied and finer. So this begs the question, will we have bodies like in the movie Avatar and so on, where we are somewhere else in our etheric bodies, but we will be able to, through these emanations, these vibrations still control a, a robotic avatar. So I'm almost at the end. I just wanted to point out, people will say, oh, the human soul couldn't do this. If you ask the question, does the human soul um, think it's having a conversation with a person at the other end of a telephone? Well, yes, of course it thinks that. But it's actually participating in a virtual reality space. Your voice, and my voice right now, has been digitized. You're not actually hearing my voice. You're hearing a virtual facsimile of my voice. And many of you, when you get in the car and you're driving, and I'm not sure what that means if we're about to lose this again, but um, you get a feel for your car. Your soul takes the place of the space of the car. You feel all the vibrations. So you can see that this is, in a way, leading towards uh, being able to be in an avatar body. So there's generational differences. Uh, this you can read here. I have an idea. Um, here, play with this iPhone, but do not, I repeat, do not unlock it. Bingo. So obviously, uh, younger generation are often capable of things that the older ones are not regarding technology. And it asks the question, do they come differently prepared for the life in which they were expecting to incarnate into? I just wanted to point out that there's a number of things that I fully agree with, despite what I've been saying in this. I think it is good to set up in your homes electromagnetic radiation-free zones. Um, I got a meter and found out what things were emanating dangerously high levels. And once I moved those out of my office, my persistent headaches went away. It's also probably good to turn those off at night. Um, when you carry a mobile phone, think about where you're placing it. Um, some people I've seen 
push it into their bra, for example, or into a pocket. Uh, I'm not sure those are good ideas. Uh, definitely don't sleep with your phone. And it's good to be able to put your phone on um, a higher volume or talk so you can hold it away from your brain while you're talking. It's also very important when you're using computers to get up and move around every 30 minutes or so. Movement's important not only for your body and your posture, but also for your mind and soul. Um, many of us enjoy our comforts, but it's important to be active. Active not only in your body, but in your mind. Um, when you get up and you move about, you're also moving your focus of your senses. It's good to experience variations in temperatures and distances for your eyes. Um, all of this at least every 30 minutes, uh, within every 30 minutes. <clears throat> And many of us, and I see this in my own kids, long to be entertained. This is a lifestyle problem of technology. And back to this question of our will. Um, we need, in our development of a uh, Christ impulse, to love to be able to do. I'm also suggesting fasting one day a week and developing friendships where um, that socialness is, is nurtured beyond what you can do through technology. So all of these things I think are important, but all of this will be changing and those who are coming, who are in each younger generation will find ways to develop those friendships and be nourished in new and different ways. I continue to do research in the questions of movement and moral technology, where we're looking at vibratory, uh, sympathetic vibratory physics. Um, I'm looking at Dewey Larson's reciprocity system theory. Uh, there's some very exciting things here. And I continue to look at electricity, which also is an ether, albeit a fallen one. Um, many people think Electricity is evil, it is not, it is only a carrier of evil, but only because of our concepts of what is electricity. And I also want to point out that uh, initially what we call moral technology in some of these anthroposophical circles uh, is really just going to be an interface to a machine. That machine may operate electronically. A moral technology that operates totally with different and, shall we say, higher ethers is something that's much farther off in the future. So, <clears throat> um, when you are asking a question amongst others, do I have to do this? Can't someone else do it? Um, these are the challenges to finding one's will. And so this little quote from the Michaelic Age is important here. Out of desperate circumstances, the new Christ experience will evolve. Trying outer circumstances will become inner soul trials. And out of these soul trials, vision will be born. So we've looked at fear and to fear not this future. We've looked at not the what, but the how is what's important because this merging of humanity and our physical bodies with machines will happen. And it is a slippery slope where we will be getting altruistically, but slipping into uh, wearing these ourselves. And the question not, is not the what, but the how, and then who will be doing this. And I urge anthroposophists to get involved and then I talked about where we're going with this and the research that still needs to be done. And so let's turn our phones back on and entertain any questions. So I 
Andrew, I'm interested in why you included fasting in the remedies. <laughs> That's a good question. I do because um, in order to develop the will, there are number of activities that we can do. And I think fasting is one that can help us develop the will so that the body does not rule the soul. I can uh, completely support that. Uh, without this kind of framework of, uh, of meaning that you've given us, I've been fasting for 20 years. And absolutely, it's been an exercise of developing will. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I didn't expect you to raise that, but I can support the, uh, the approach uh, enthusiastically. Well, thank you, Grant. Other questions? I know we're way over time and we've lost some of the people, which is to be expected because uh, they couldn't go past the hour. Sorry for that problem with Zoom and, and I'm just really surprised they let it let us resume the session. So. Micah, you had a question? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I have a lot of big questions. Um, I, I want to thank you because you really you presented technology in, in, in what would I what I would call a very positive um, way, and um, it's certainly something you know something that we all obviously are dealing with because we're we're living in this technological time and it's so fast and there's so much new technology every day.